Well, welcome all. My name is Seth Green, and I'm the Dean of the University of Chicago Graham School. And it's a privilege to welcome you to our discussion on understanding the turbulence in the House, a reference to the US House of Representatives, and the fact that as of today, October 23rd, 2023, there is no speaker of this House. Uh, and we are here to talk with someone who truly understands the history behind this moment. Dr. Fred Beitler is a historian who got his PhD here at the University of Chicago. He then went on to be the deputy historian of the US House of Representatives. And he then went on to become the associate dean here at the University of Chicago Graham School. And we are incredibly grateful that we have been able to have him continue in his work with our school as a beloved instructor of numerous courses including last year, a history that looked across America's contested understanding of our past, and this year, looking at the relationship of technology and society. Uh, and so let me take down our screen here so we can see you, Fred, and I'll add myself so we can be in conversation. And let me just start by thanking you for the work that you've done for the U.S. House. You even got the cup uh, ready to go, I see. Uh, and let me start with, you know, setting a little bit of the table and then we'll jump into the, the history. Um, I think everyone is here because you know that we are in a place where uh, we had the first removal of a Speaker of the House in U.S. history. Uh, and you are also probably here because you are curious what happens next. As you know, we don't have a Speaker. Uh, we've had a number of people that have gone up for election after getting out of the conference not to make it to a decisive vote. And as of this morning, it looks like there are nine more candidates who want to enter uh, this fraud process. And so what we want to do in this conversation is we want to take you back to the very beginnings. We want to give you historical context on the structure of our government, the structure of the Congress, the structure of the speaker role. Watch how it evolved over time. And then I promise we will come to this moment and how all of that history is reflected and also challenges us as we enter this highly polarized time. Uh, but Fred, maybe we can start uh, this conversation with the founders and talk a little bit about the foundations because our founders intended a different form of government than the parliamentary system in England. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the intent behind the branches of government and the role of Congress in particular before we jump into the speaker role. And you're on mute, but um, you have the power to unmute. There thank you, you Seth, and thank you for setting this up on uh, one of the things I published a short article a couple weeks ago uh, on the turbulence in the House. And why did I use that uh, as a title? Some of it, it seems turbulent, but I wanted to go back to the first real speaker of the House, uh, and that's going to be Henry Clay, who created the speakership as we know it today, uh, at least parts of it. Uh, and one of the things, he was originally a senator. Uh, but he decided to run for his House seat in 1810 because he, quote, preferred the turbulence of the House over the solemn stillness of the Senate. Uh, and yes, we have the idea of turbulence that's there. It was at that time the more exciting body. Uh, we go shifting back and forth between the two. But you ask about what the founders envisioned. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how the differences in the United States is uh, in our constitutional system from the British Constitution. The United States has the second oldest constitution in the world, uh, and it's the oldest with a written constitution, and this is one of the major differences. The English Constitution is not written. Uh, it comes out really after 1688-89, after the Glorious Revolution, but the American founders wanted to have a written document, something that you could go back to. Some of the things in the Constitution that the founders are thinking is consistent with what the British Constitution is. Others are deliberately different. And one of the things deliberately different is it's written down rather than something that is uh, Parliament can change. Uh, and we'll look at questions of separation of powers. But one of the things that's in continuity, uh, there is a Speaker of the House of Commons and uh, in Great Britain. And one of the things the founders envisioned, they put in the Constitution that uh, this House of Representatives shall choose their speakers and other officers. Uh, and so this is in the Constitution itself with the founders envisioning. 
But one of the things that the founders did is they wanted to make sure that sovereignty was separated, uh, that there would be, uh, there is no, uh, unlike uh, what Harry Truman kind of claimed, he had on his desk a little symbol said, the buck stops here, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, the president is not ultimately in charge, but the House is not either, nor is the Senate, nor is the Supreme Court. Uh, it's the American people speaking through the Constitution that is truly sovereign, but through those, uh, how that body and how this document uh, develops. And so uh, one of the things that is the major change that takes place, uh, and the person who changes it is Henry Clay. Uh, and Henry Clay, he was a senator. Uh, and then he stepped back or stepped back, not down. He stepped back uh, and ran for the House because he wanted to implement an agenda. And he is the one that transformed the speakership, uh, not as a mere presiding officer like that person is in the House of Commons, but rather head of party. Uh, and it's the one to set the legislative agenda. And so if we look and see one of the differences between the British system and the American, as you look at the Office of Speaker, uh, in the British system, they've separated two parts. One is leader of the party. The other is chief parliamentarian. Uh, in the House of Representatives in the United States, it's combined, the presiding officer and party leader. Uh, and the person who did that was Henry Clay uh, back in uh, 1811. He was elected on his first vote, first uh, first vote, his first time sitting uh, as a member of the House of Representatives, and his followers uh, voted uh, for him. And what he did is uh, really put all of his allies on key committee chairs. He was the one to be the strong partisan leader. He participated in debates, enforced House rules, and set the legislative agenda. Uh, and thus, from that point on, the speaker was the leader of the majority party in the House. So uh, just to set that up and some key differences. But go ahead, Saffron, if you wanted to uh, follow up with some questions. It's there. Well, so I'll just set that scene a little bit more finely, Fred, and then I'm going to come back to you. So okay. um, we set up a different government structure than we had formerly in England, right? There's an intentional division of government, as you described. And there's a possibility, unlike the parliamentary system, that the Congress would actually have a different party than the presidency. It's not necessary, but it's possible, unlike this past system. Um, and then part two is that the speaker role combines here the possibility of both being a party leader and a presiding officer. And so I just want to kind of lay that out and then come back to you and ask the question of, you know, does that mean before Henry Clay, that the speaker role looked different and what did it look like in the first few decades of our country and then and then we'll come to the current uh, era so to speak you know henry clay and beyond where it's partisan and people are appointing their own to committee leadership and things like that uh, it's a good uh, question when you talk about it how was the early speaker the early speaker was a presiding officer one who saw themselves as neutral uh, as the House was developing its rules and enforcing the rules, as someone who's purely impartial. Uh, and one of the things that the founders were envisioning, were hoping, uh, was that there would not be parties, that there would not be political parties. And, and there's a number of warnings that the, the framers of the Constitution and others are against the party spirit. But already within the first Congress, uh, parties start to develop. And that will become uh, really a way that you see with James Madison's understanding, uh, as he describes it in the Federalist Papers, uh, that what you would do is you'd try to find ways to prevent a tyranny of the majority. And so one of the things that you did in looking at the legislative body, uh, rather than have, well, it's, it's a little, and I'm going to be a historian sometimes and equivocate, uh, but in the 18th century in the British uh, Parliament, uh, their parliament was also was the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And it went back and forth as to which it was the dominant branch. But you'd also have the king. And so with a British parliamentary system, the entirety of the British people are represented in this term called parliament. That means the king, uh, the king's ministers, uh, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Uh, and so that is the entire single sovereignty. 
The American founders were worried about that because you could have a single group in charge of the whole thing and thus have no check on sovereignty. So what the founders did is they divided sovereignty. The president has a certain amount of power, uh, but he cannot enter the House chamber without permission. Uh, he can't introduce a bill, uh, whereas the prime minister in England uh, is one who is a member of parliament and can introduce a piece of legislation. Um, what takes place basically in the British system is now you have the House of Commons and as the dominant branch and, and the House of Lords can only slow things down uh, and the king does not have a legislative role other than merely being head of state. Uh, but the American system is divided and it's designed that way so that you'd have three different bodies, political branches, the president, the House and the Senate, all elected by different constituencies on a different time cycle. Uh, and that's going to be very important as we look at the stability of the United States and its resilience, uh, because the the framers were worried about a tyranny of the majority, some single party taking control uh, with merely 50 percent plus one and then be able to dominate the government for the entire term and, and within parliament, um, usually it's a maximum of a five year term. Uh, and they didn't want to have on one single day the election of all the various uh, political off, uh, representatives or, or members of parliament all on the same day uh, at the same time with similar constituents. They wanted to spread that out. And I'll talk about further of how that operates. But uh, the very idea of having a president of one party, a Senate, maybe of uh, his party and a house that could be of a different party. That's something that is built into the American system, right at the right at the beginning, right in the Constitution. Um, you had a second question. I wanted to. to well, let's follow that me. train of thought that you're on. So there's the setup of the divided government in the Constitution. There's the naming of the speaker, but there's not a designation of how they are elected. And Henry Clay then comes in a few decades into our country's founding and reshapes this role from being this neutral, impartial presiding officer to being a party leader that is using the spoils of this role to try to distribute power in a way that could advance an agenda. And so that is not dissimilar from the speaker that we know today. And so I want to kind of come from that moment forward, Fred. And the next big moment I know from our preparatory exchange is in the 1850s, when there's a spike, uh, you know, a big fight over the speaker uh, role, and they have dozens of votes, um, which may uh, sound a little bit, uh, you know, relevant. Although, uh, you know, that was a very tumultuous time, 1859 and 1860. Uh, but yeah, can we talk about that era? Because I think there are at least some echoes uh, that might feel resonant today. Now, that's a. It, it's interesting to sort of look at how the constitution is written and the, the structured. But then in many ways, the more important aspect is the evolution of the various bodies. And if you look at American history, you can kind of see it, at least the political history, as a fight between the various political branches as to who sets the nation's agenda, uh, in agenda on policy. And so one of the things that's interesting, Henry Clay decides to jump into the House to become speaker in 1810 or 1811 is, is when he became speaker after the 1810 election. But then as the country try, is expanding and wrestles with the question of what to do with things like slavery. Uh, Illinois, I'm speaking, uh, University of Chicago is in Illinois, and Illinois does a, um, uh, becomes a state as kind of a, a compromise between Southerners and Northerners. Uh, in 1820, it's Henry Clay who negotiates the major compromise that keeps uh, the balance equal in the Senate between slave states and free states in order to stay in the stability, the so-called Missouri Compromise. And one of the things that he did is once that gets passed, all the action then goes to the Senate. And so Henry Clay then spe spends the next 30 years in the Senate uh, negotiating how the various compromises take place to hold the United States together during a time of national expansion, but also the question of what to do with the major issue that uh, is on really key part of leading up to the 1850s. Uh, and that's going to be the question of slavery. And so Henry Clay will negotiate a next compromise in 1850, 
uh, to keep the nation together. But then Clay and uh, Daniel Webster and John C. Calhoun all will pass. Uh, and that sets up also struggles for the speakership. There was a minor struggle for the speakership uh, in 1849. That's after the Mexican War, uh, where you have vote after vote after vote, up or to uh, almost 50 votes, and they couldn't come up with a speaker uh, who would have the majority, partly because uh, the Whig party was disintegrating, was fracturing. And so there was no party that had a majority. And finally, they um, somebody asked, uh, they put a motion to have a plurality candidate as speaker. Uh, and they finally got one, uh, Howell Cobb, a Democrat of Georgia, uh, who uh, presided as a speaker with almost 50 ballots, uh, almost 60 ballots. But that's the only time the speaker had a plurality. Uh, and it shows some of the divisions within the parties as the parties fragment. In 1856, a new party runs a candidate for president, the Republican Party, uh, born in Wisconsin, and uh, they picked James Fremont. Uh, but then in 1860, that will be the party, actually, the 1860 presidential election will have two candidates from Illinois, uh, but two others as well. And one of the things in 1858 with that election, it was also so divisive based on the sectional issue that's there. And so they ended up going with a compromise candidate. They did have a majority. The uh, Republicans had a majority in 1850, 1859. And just, a, a, um, yeah, the historian in me has to say it. Uh, the Constitution has a provision originally that the uh, Congress would meet every once a year, at least, in the first Monday in December. And so the Congress that's elected in 1858 did not start until December 1859. So 13 months later, uh, and that Congress came in uh, to organize itself about three days after they hung uh, John Brown for his um uh, raid at Harper's Ferry. So this gives you the idea of the, the sectionalism that's taking place. But uh, a number of the, the key uh, Republicans were be, uh, had uh, sort of endorsed a book called The Impending Crisis, which was predicting the Civil War. And so that made uh, those individuals, the leader of the Republican Party then was John Sherman of Ohio, uh, the brother of William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, and he was the one... Um, uh, uh, really, he could not come to a majority. And so after over 60 ballots, uh, what, what they finally did is pick a, 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 I'm sorry, a 44 ballots. What they finally did is pick a first term congressman, a fellow from New Jersey by the name of William Pennington, uh, was in his first term as a member of Congress as a compromise candidate because he hadn't said anything publicly. And so they put him in place uh, and, and he only lasted, uh, I mean, his, uh, uh, constituents voted him out uh, of office the next uh, uh, Congress. And so he's the first sitting congressman and first sitting speaker of the House to be unelected by his constituents after uh, serving that term. Um, but uh, somebody pointed out in the chat that I said was important. The, spe the uh, uh, Constitution does not require the speaker to be a member of the House. Uh, you can be someone else. The, the Constitution leaves that open uh, to what the qualifications of a speaker are. Uh, but in the history of the House, there hasn't been any non-members uh, who have been speakers of the House. And I know there was some talk uh, about that. And, and uh, uh, it was, um, but anyway, there has been some talk. It's possible constitutionally, but nobody has ever uh, been that way. Yeah, so go ahead. So I think we're now through the you know 1860 uh, moment. And what you've described so far, Fred, is that you know it gets, partisan around the time of Henry Clay in the 1810s. Then you come into this period, late 1840s through early 1860s, the country is deeply divided and the house and the speakership uh, becomes more and more difficult to elect and to function, right? So, I mean, just to draw some parallels there that I think many people can maybe relate to in terms of you know how polarization today is probably making it much more difficult to find a speaker than it was, you know, decades ago. And so I want to now play forward uh, the second half, so to speak, of the story that that brings us to today. Um, and I, I believe, you know, this is post-Civil War now. We're going to come to Speaker Reed and 
kind of what's happening in the 1880s with Reed rules, but I'll let you speak to that. Yes, uh, after the Civil War, uh, the United States becomes really its most partisan period. Uh, and partisan meaning of party, okay? And, and one of the things we may wanna uh, clarify is civility is different than partisanship. Uh, partisanship is of party. Civility is uh, working together in decorum of, associated with specific rules that are there. And the House of Representatives, uh, this is uh, maybe a little inside, but I think it's important of how the Senate and the House operate. Um, the Senate, since 1789, has always been in existence. Uh, the Senate is always there because after every each uh, election cycle, only a third of the senators are selected, elected. And, and uh, so because each senator has a six year term and they've staggered. So a third is up for reelection at every time. The House is brand new every two years. Uh, and that's something that's really important in the dynamic. I, I uh, noticed that when I was up on, on Capitol Hill, uh, senators walk slower than congressmen. Uh, it, it, it's interesting because they've got six years. Uh, and even if it's a two years early on in that that first two year, their first Congress, they got four more years before they have to run for reelection, uh, whereas a member of Congress run is running constantly. Uh, and so they literally walk faster than the senators do. And you could see the pace within the, the chambers. Um, senators can talk as long as they want on anything they want. Uh, whereas a House member is very narrow, uh, very narrowly uh, controlled time-wise. Uh, and this is, uh, people sometimes ask me, uh, why did you leave uh, being deputy historian of the House? Wasn't that your dream job? And I kind of look at them and say, well, I had 435 bosses. Uh, and so there's something about a situation like that is how do you control a body with that many people? And uh, somebody used to ask me, we'd always, I bring in a number of teachers and, and they would ask me as they look at the house floor, it's like, why don't they use Robert's rules of order? Uh, and so I'd, I'd look and say, well, who was Henry Roberts? Henry Roberts was a Civil War general uh, who, after the Civil War, was asked to run a meeting. Uh, and it was a disaster. Uh, and so I figured, how can I uh, figure out how to run a meeting? What I'm going to do is I'm going to look and ask, see what Congress does. Uh, and if you've ever used Robert's Rules of Order, Henry Roberts has all, all these charts and things of what is a privileged motion and who can, what does it mean to table and how many votes here and there. Uh, there really fundamentally are two principles in Robert's Rules of Order. He never says them, uh, but they're fundamental to understand what Robert's Rules is. And Robert's Rules, for those of you who aren't familiar, that's what uh, are the sort of procedures that most uh, organizations run. You're everything from the your condo association to uh, uh, sometimes political parties uh, down to church trustees. They use Robert's Rules. Well, what are the two principles of Robert's Rules of Order? He never says them, but they're built in. One is minority right. The majority can never silence the minority. The second is majority rule. The majority cannot stop the majority. The minority cannot stop the majority from working its will. So minority right, majority will. You can't silence the minority, but you can't stop the process, right? The majority has to work its will. Well, as I look at it, what has evolved over the course of 200 and odd years in the United States is the Senate has more or less adopted that minority right position. Uh, the Senate, based on the Constitution, the senators represent states and all states are equal to each other. Yes, uh, all senators then are equal to each other. Some senators are more equal than others, we know, uh, but every senator is an individual and has equal rights with all other senators. That means the senators can always speak to anything on the floor. Uh, and you see it, the, the sort of power that will take place is you've seen this over the last uh, the last year or so. Uh, uh, Senator Tommy Tuberville, of, a Republican from Alabama, has been blocking um, congressional appointments to the military. Well, he hasn't been blocking them. What he's been doing is most, uh, almost all the Senate business is done unanimously. 
uh, meaning that any single senator can hold up the process because what takes place usually is uh, the majority leader will say, I ask for unanimous consent to do X. And if one senator will go up and say, I don't consent, they move on to other business. Uh, the majority leader could always call for a vote, uh, and then it will take a supermajority, usually 60 votes on most things, in order to proceed to business. Uh, that's a motion of cloture closing off what's called a filibuster. That's how the, the Senate operates, and most of us understand, at least, at least a little bit knowing civics, you know what a filibuster is. Uh, but that represents the principle of minority right. Uh, in the House, on the other hand, uh, there was some really um, significant and major issues that took place in the 19th century. Uh, and it was very difficult to uh, work those principles out because the minority party oftentimes always wanted to speak or if they knew they wouldn't win to slow the process down or have a series of ways to to slow the process dilatory motions for example like you'll saw you saw some of them and you see some some of them sometimes at the end of each congress um but um uh, like calling for a quorum and then you have to stop the procedures in the house and go through the list to make sure everybody's there. Uh, other times there's other dilatory motions. And, and one of the problems that was taking place in a partisan age in the late 19th century was that all this business would be slowed or stopped. Uh, and uh, Thomas Brackett Reed, a Republican from uh, Maine, was very frustrated about this because the Congress couldn't do its will. The majority could not work its will. Uh, and so he was first appointed chairman of the Rules Committee, the Rules Committee in the House, and then he was uh, elected speaker. And one of the things that he did, uh, several things he did, but but um, it's Thomas Brackett Reed who does a series of rules changes within the House uh, that makes it a majoritarian institution. Uh, as Reed said uh, at one point, let me get a quote is, I'm, I'm quoting, the purpose of the rules of the House is not to protect the minority, but to allow the majority to work its will. That's the majoritarian principles that that um, uh, Thomas Brackett Reed put in, the Reed rules. And I'll give you one, one example. Uh, there was a uh, delaying tactics. One of the ones was so-called disappearing quorum. Uh, a quorum is a majority of members, but uh, of members elected. But if you leave the room, you are, uh, are not counted. And during the 19th century before Reed came in, if you didn't say you were present when the roll was called, you were marked as absent. And so what would take place is the House had a majority, but the minority refused to answer. And so there wasn't a quorum. And Reed one day got up and started to uh, have the clerk call the roll. And what he did is, uh, when Democrats were refusing to answer a quorum call, he began counting those present in the chamber. One Democrat elected uh, objected and stated, I deny your right, Mr. Speaker, to count me as present. Reed replied simply, the chair is making a statement of fact that the gentleman is present. Do you wish to deny it? Uh, and you know, at that point, you couldn't. And that's a major change that takes place uh, because now all of a sudden, people leaving the the chamber uh, would could not deny the ability to work to to work its business. He even did a few things to to uh, uh, he actually even locked the doors at certain points in time, uh, forbidding people from leaving. They would even a couple of them. There's a occasion that we try to climb out the window so they wouldn't be counted uh, in the house. Uh, at one point to keep a, a to make sure that you had the majority, he actually brought in a couple of Republican members who were ill in the hospital. He brought them in on stretchers just to get up to get that majority. Uh, but for these changes in the rules, he was called a czar, a despot. Uh, mm -hmm. And Czar Reed is one who really made the house where the majority rules. Um, and it, he's really the one of the two most powerful speakers in the history of the House of Representatives. The other is Joe Cannon. And one of the things that's interesting, the, the Democrats were so upset about these Reed rules. But when the Democrats came in power uh, in the subsequent Congress, they kept all the rules, uh, which is interesting to see as the evolution of the parliamentary process functions. Oftentimes it's bipartisan because you want to make sure that the House is able to do its job to allow that majority to function, to, to act its way out. 
Um, but one of the things that, uh, well, uh, the next most powerful speaker uh, was a congressman from Illinois, uh, Joe Cannon, uh, from South Illinois, uh, sort of central Illinois, from the town of Danville. Uh, he was he actually had met uh, Abraham Lincoln, and he was one of the pallbearers at Abraham Lincoln's funeral. Um, but he came in as a speaker in the early 20th century. Uh, and he was one who had been appropriations chairman, and we'll talk about the appropriations committee, the, the spending committee. And then he moved up to the speakership, and he was the one to rule the House with an iron hand, uh, making sure that all his partisans were on all the committees. But the most important, but he was sitting on the rules committee. And to um, this is also pretty inside baseball, but if you know what the filibuster is in the Senate. That's the principle of minority rights. Any con any senator has the ability to speak on anything uh, and can hold up the proceedings. That's minority right, the unan unanimity and also um, a unanimous consent and also the filibuster. What's the institutional principle in the House? It's the Rules Committee. Now, the Rules Committee, this is the rule book. This is my copy, the rule book, right? And actually, if you go back in the beginning, uh, Thomas Jefferson writes one of the first parts of it uh, because he didn't have all that much to do as vice president. And while he was presiding over the Senate, he actually drafted a manual, uh, a manual of rules of procedure. Okay, uh, that works. Um, but each Congress, the House has to pass one of these brand new and each party can tinker with it. Generally, they stay the same, but some of it sets things like committee jurisdiction. Uh, who is, for example, responsible for revenue bills? Well, that's the Ways and Means Committee. And who is responsible for energy uh, legislation and getting, say, for example, a, a piece on self-driving cars? Well, that's the Energy and Commerce Commission. Okay, these are all put in place. Um, but that's not the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee has to draft it. But Really, the Rules Committee is the function of the majority. Uh, there are nine majority members and five minority members on that committee. Uh, what is always the vote? Uh, they're the ones who are the gatekeeper of any legislation that comes to the floor. And so it's the Rules Committee that set the agenda. And Joe Cannon was head of the Rules Committee as Speaker. Well, in 1910, there was a revolt by one group within the Republican Party, the, the progressive Republicans led by George Norris of, of uh, Nebraska. Uh, and he wanted legislation to go through, the agenda to go through. He had a very popular president, or I had a popular president, Teddy Roosevelt. Now it's William Howard Taft, who wanted to advance significant amount of legislation. Uh, and Joe Cannon kept blocking it. Um, which uh, uh, Joe Cannon kept blocking much of this legislation, as he put it, uh, we don't really need any new laws around here. Uh, and so he would prevent this. Uh, Norris actually put through a provision, a privilege motion to enable, uh, uh, and he got Democratic votes to strip some of the power from the Speaker, and in fact, remove the Speaker from the Rules Committee. Uh, and that's what they did in 1910. So the Rules Committee is no longer has the speaker on it. And there's a few other things they do, too. But it significantly lessens uh, the speaker's autocratic powers. Uh, then there was a motion to vacate the chair uh, that Speaker Cannon allowed to go through. And Norris and the other progressive Republicans realized that if they continued to vote with the Democrats, because there it was a progressive Republicans and Democrats voted to strip the power uh, that to remove the speaker from the Rules Committee. Uh, what took place thereafter is that the progressive Republicans, not wanting a Democrat to be speaker, joined with Cannon and he survived that motion to vacate. Um, that's a, an interesting way that you've seen uh, some stories going back to that point, because that's the only time there has been a motion to vacate the chair that has been voted on until two weeks ago. Uh, and that's the parliamentary maneuver to allow a single member to uh, provide a privilege motion to have a vote on whether the chair is, quote, vacant. That happened uh, two weeks, uh, three weeks ago, uh, tomorrow. Uh, and that's why we're in the situation we're in. Uh, because now there's no speaker. Uh, the, uh, there's a speaker, a speaker pro tem who just has the authority to 
call for an election, preside over the election of the new speaker. Uh, and so that's where we are right now. Um, uh, so go ahead, Seth, sorry. Um, yeah, no, this is uh, fascinating. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna bring us kind of to today or you know, at least the, the last three decades uh, because the final real reshaping of the speaker role is in all of our lifetimes with Newt Gingrich and how he brings this new wave of uh, of, of you know the contract with America, but then also a, a new uh, kind of visibility to the speaker, just at a time when C-SPAN and other mechanisms are making Congress more and more transparent. Um, can you just give us the snapshot of how that kind of reshapes uh, the speaker role into what we know it to be today? And then we'll jump into the current moment, and then we will take your questions. We're going to go a little beyond our allotted time to do so. So for those who can Stay with us till 155. We'll make sure to get as many questions as possible. But uh, tell us about Newt and how he brings us into the modern era, so to speak. That's a, yeah, that's very important to understand these structures that work within the House. Uh, after the uh, the revolt against Joe Cannon, uh, the speaker becomes significantly weaker, but the power doesn't go back to the states. The power goes to the committee chairman. And so from the time of, of really 1910, up until 1995, uh, the power in the House was in the committee chairman. Uh, Sam Rayburn of Texas was the longest serving speaker, uh, a somewhat powerful, but his was only a power of persuasion, uh, not of real institutional binding and party discipline. Um, it took uh, really parts of it was the opening of, of uh, television cameras and the C-SPAN cameras uh, in the House of Representatives in 1979 that allowed backbenchers like Newt Gingrich uh, to have public visibility. Uh, he would speak. There's only three times you can speak in the House. Um, one is in the morning for one minute. If you up there in front, they usually do like four or five one minute speeches. Um, then it's when your committee has legislation on the floor, but that time is controlled by the chairman. And so if you're an outsider, you never get to speak then. And the other is right at the end of the night. Uh, when all the House business of the day ends and they really let anybody uh, speak um, uh, because they assume nobody's listening. And before the television cameras, nobody was. Uh, and they would just put things in the congressional record and you go home and say, here, I talked about, you know, such and such legislation, but nobody was paying attention in the House. But Gingrich uh, used the C-SPAN cameras uh, to do long special orders at night um, where nobody else was in the room except a, a speaker pro tem presiding. Uh, and he used these to really uh, raise his profile and the profile of his colleagues. And he used that as a way to mobilize outsiders within the House, uh, within the Republican Party uh, and the House to lead to the nationalizing of a congressional election with the contract with America on, in 1994, winning the Republicans the majority control of the House for the first time in over 40 years. Uh, and one of the things Gingrich did is he brought a significant uh, amount of power away from the committee chairman and back to the speaker, centralizing much of the, the power uh, in the speaker's office. And a couple of those things was uh, he would select the committee chairman rather than seniority uh, and also he put term limits on committee chairman. And Gingrich had a, a rough uh, a period within the House, but what you have is um, what you have is a significant amount of power centralized in the speakership. Uh, that continued with a few bumps uh, of people who attempted to become a speaker. Uh, but then um, uh, with Dennis Haster, uh, Dennis Haster sort of wanted to reduce the profile of the speaker, uh, but keep the power. And so he set up steering committee that would choose the committee chairman. He, of course, picked everyone on the steering committee. And he also had five votes in the speaker. OK, uh, uh, fair enough. But but uh, uh, it's interesting then when uh, the Republicans lost the, the House after the 2006 election, uh, Mrs. Pelosi kept that same structure. And so since really 1995, there's been an enormous amount of power in the speaker's office uh, that has been consistent with Republican and Democrat. Uh, 
uh, since that point, since 1995. So go ahead, Seth, if you wanted well, to. And now let's jump into this moment because one of the unique reasons that Kevin McCarthy may be the first speaker to be removed is that as you've described since the very beginning, you know, the Congress itself shall set its own rules for the speaker and how they're both elected and how they are potentially, you know, called or removed. And so can you talk about the fight that kind of leads us to today, which is, you know, the original vote for speaker for uh, ultimately Kevin McCarthy, but many votes and ultimately the ability for one person to call that election again. So I think that, you know, the way you've described this is that we're constantly reinventing this role. And indeed, there was in some ways a reinvention taking place uh, just before the election of Kevin McCarthy, which helps us to understand the moment we're in. And so, yeah, can you bring us up to, to this moment? Yes, um, yes, I can. Uh, and, and one of the things that I didn't mention is that the Senate is a place of individuals. The House is a place of groups. Uh, in the American political tradition, one's rights are individual, but our politics are the group. And so in the House, because it's so large, everything is based on the groups you're in. Some of the groups are party. Some of the groups are your committee and your expertise on your committee. Others are these things called caucuses, which are informal groups of like-minded individuals. And, and there's upwards of 400 different caucuses uh, that are on there. And any congressman and congresswoman uh, can join with others. Oftentimes they're bipartisan. One of my favorite caucuses was the um, uh, the Congressional Craft Beer Caucus uh, of members who uh, wanted to promote craft beer, um, which they always had great receptions. Uh, but uh, one of the things that the parties are made up of there are a couple parties that cross the line. I actually uh, had to speak uh, before the uh, House Center Isle Caucus, uh, which were people on both sides of the center aisle that were joining together uh, in order to provide bipartisan uh, support. There's uh, the, um, the Problem Solvers Caucus is also a part with Democrats and Republicans on there. But the rest, the Republicans have a number of large caucuses uh, sort of parties within parties, as you can see it, if you take a look at that. One is the um, uh, uh, Republican, the Republican Study Group, or the Freedom Caucus, uh, or the uh, there's about five or so of these that divide up much of the House. And one of the things that took place is there was not a full majority to elect Kevin McCarthy back in January a speaker, uh, and the. Congressional Freedom Caucus insisted on a number of concessions to move power away from the Speaker's office. And McCarthy, in order to uh, finally get elected after 15 ballots, uh, agreed to some of those changes in how the House functioned. And one of those was to allow a single individual to have a, 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 a call for a motion to vacate the chair. And that's exactly what happened uh, three weeks ago tomorrow. But that is one of the groups that are there. There's not a majority of the Republican conference. Uh, there are a number of, uh, it's a coalition of various caucuses. Uh, one of the things that is a was a practice that Speaker Hastert put together is that there would only be brought to the floor things that were, quote, supported by the majority of the majority. That means a majority of the Republican conference, if you're in the conference, you would actually, even if you disagreed, but for party unity, you had to follow once the vote hit the floor. That we've seen has broken down uh, completely. And so one of the things that the Republicans are, at least three or four of the, or I think it's about five or six, of the candidates for speaker have agreed that they will support whomever the Republican conference chooses as their speaker designate. Uh, that was not the case with uh, uh, Stephen Scalise, uh, and nor with uh, Jim Jordan. Uh, there was an agreement within the Republican Party. But now you, at least some of these candidates, are saying that whatever is resolved with the majority in the Republican conference, then we'll reinstitute the majority of the majority and we'll support that person on the floor. We'll see if that works. Yeah. Well, so I have this final question. I'm going to come then to the questions that are in the chat. Um, as you think about how our politics and our context have shaped the speaker role. Because you know, when you brought us through the history, you kind of explained what was happening in the country and then here's what's happening in the speaker role. And there's not a totally predictable relationship, but there is clearly 
correlations between the two, right? When we're highly polarized, it's more difficult to get a speaker through. When we're in a place where there is a kind of really strong precedent, uh, president rather, you know, uh, they can potentially push back. Uh, how would you characterize what is driving the current moment? Meaning, if you were to look at what's happening in the country and then what's happening right now with the speaker role, are there factors that you think right now are contributing to the kind of gridlock that we see? And is there a way as a historian that you see parallels between you know, our history and what's happening in our current moment? Uh, it's, it's a very divisive period in time. And that's why I brought back a couple of those times uh, in the history of the house uh, where you see where you see sometimes the breaking up of parties or the fragmentation of political parties. We're in about, depending upon how you cal calculate it, either the fifth or the sixth party system. Uh, and when you have a strong working majority, you can actually function and operate. Uh, very effectively. When you have a fragmented party, even if it's technically in the majority, uh, what will take place is that party maybe are signs of division. And so the Whig party after the Mexican War uh, starts to fraction. The Whig party has had Northerners and Southerners in it. Uh, and that speaker fight in 1849, uh, the same with the speaker fight in 1859. There's not a full majority of the whole country together. And so what that means is small groups are the balance. And so if the United States is 49% to 49%, that means the 2% in the the 2% can swing on either side. That's sort of what happened in in uh, January and in three weeks ago. But this could be the breaking up of one of the political parties. Uh, the Republicans are usually less disciplined than the Democrats are. And if you saw the various speaker votes last week, the Democrats held their um, uh, minority, the vote. They didn't lose a single vote. But if you remember back a few years ago um, that there were challenges to uh, when Mrs. Pelosi was elected, there was a number of Democrats, usually on her left, who voted against her, or at least threatened to vote against her for speaker until she made some concessions. And so what you see is possibly driven by social media and increase in the empowerment of these outsider populist members, populist members of the left and of the right. Uh, they're holding oftentimes balances of power within each of the large parties that really aggregate a lot of the, the uh, uh, political views on the difference in policies and are, are current government. And so uh, you are seeing a partisan system and the parties themselves may be fragmenting. Um, yes. And I know we're wanting some questions and and uh, go ahead, Seth. Yeah. Well, so um, there are questions from Greg Gosick and Timothy Lyman that are both getting at the same idea of the impact of the speaker impasse. And so I'll ask them together. Greg asked about how if the House is unable to conduct regular business without a speaker, is adjournment an option? And could they actually go out of session? And Timothy Lyman asked an alternative way of thinking about this, which is if um, there's a way that the rules could be changed to allow the House to conduct business while a speaker is being chosen, or is it such in the Constitution that that would require you know, a, a level of amendment that would be presumably impossible. So how do you think about what the possibilities are during this uh, period that is of unknown timeline? That's a, a very good question, a very timely question. Uh, one of it, it doesn't take a constitutional amendment. These are just yeah. internal House rules. Uh, the House rules, the House can empower the Speaker. Uh, and one of the things to think about uh, is that the House is still doing its business in its committees. Uh, the committees are still functioning. They can't bring anything to the floor yet, though. That's the, the real issue here. And so uh, one of the problems that the, the insurgents were complaining about is too much of the uh, appropriations bills were written in the Speaker's office uh, rather than through the regular order that taking place. But some of the regular order is still going on. Uh, it doesn't, uh, you can't go uh, to the floor. Uh, there have been uh, attempts last week to make uh, Patrick McCart uh, Mc uh, McHenry the um, uh, uh, Speaker pro tem to give him power to preside over the floor during uh, during uh, uh, legislation and having that 
uh, being brought to the floor. Uh, that is possible. And all that would take is a simple majority. And so you'd need, you know, if the, the Democrats still held their position, you probably only need about seven, uh, actually five or six votes uh, to make that a temporary position, one that could preside until, say, January. Um, we'll see what the, the Republican conference does, if they're able to realize that uh, they need a working majority and they need a speaker to actually get anything done. We do have a deadline coming up in less than a month. Uh, November 17th is when the last continuing resolution runs out funding the federal government. And so uh, that's the, the deadline that's there. But you don't need a constitutional amendment. All you need is there's two vacant seats. So so all you need is 217 votes for speaker or for a rules change to allow uh, the current speaker pro tem to operate as a speaker. Uh, so it, it can be done and it can be done by tomorrow, but uh, uh, I'm skeptical it will. It'll take a number of votes, I would imagine, uh, because this party is too fragmented uh, and, and um uh, the Republican majority is too fragmented. And it may be, if you look at the United States, is there a majority fully? Uh, and that's something that I think is important for us to think about as we try to figure out ways to maybe rather than governing from the extremes, uh, instead finding a way to govern from a, a broad consensus uh, that's in place. So Seth, go ahead. Well, and can we build on that, Fred, because it was interesting here as we think about broad consensus and the possibility of compromise that was intended by the founders without parties, uh, which have since developed and become very institutionalized. Um, the Democrats play a big role in this moment in that they you know, partner with Matt Gates and move forward with the removal. Um, are there precedents for that? Is there a way to think about that domain? Because there's polarization within the Republican Party, and, and you spoke to that, but there's also the polarization of the country such that, you know, the Democrats also arguably fall into that and are also a part of this moment in their, you know, uniformity of alignment with someone who, you know, I, I think would have to be argued does not share their um, goals on policy or other factors. And so I'm just curious if you have any precedent for that or any way to think about that from a historical context. Well, yes, there is quite a bit of precedent to look at it, to find ways of how uh, parties work together uh, within. And, and one of the things that I think is, is important uh, sort of context, not just the uh, progressive Republican revolt against uh, Speaker Joe Cannon in 1910, but uh, some of the operations of the 1960s, uh, when you had a Republican Party that was usually united and two Democratic parties. You had a Northern Democratic Party and a Southern Democratic Party. And sometimes the Northern Democrats would uh, work with the Republicans to pass civil rights legislation. Uh, other times on social legislation, Southern Democrats would join with uh, Northern Democrats to pass uh, things like Medicare, for example. Uh, and on defense, Southern Democrats and Republicans. So there what you had is a three-party system uh, that organized the Congress uh, with a majority, but they'd have bipartisan or, or uh, shifting majorities on various policy legislation. Um, one of the things to think about is the parties are generally weak, uh, and it may be seen some internal reforms to strengthen the parties, to maybe move much more towards uh, consensus candidates within. And one of the more interesting uh, proposals was ranked choice voting, not in the general election, which would be dangerous, uh, but in the primaries, party primaries. Uh, and there, what you develop is to have everybody's second choice, uh, and that would moderate some of the extremes in um, uh, of the sort of rogue individual members, like the eight members there, uh, like Getz has a completely safe district. And so it's only in the primary that really will have the effect of, of uh, uh, support or losing that support. And, and that's something that, much of it, we're going to have to wait. Uh, the House is going to limp around. Uh, maybe they'll pass a big omnibus legislation, uh, but then you've got divisions in this House and Senate. And so even if the 12 appropriation bills are passed by significant majorities, they're not going to pass the Senate. And so we're going to have this uh, situation will last us, well, uh, coming up on a year from now. And so the next major time that we can weigh in on this, uh, even if they 
elect a speaker will be in November of 2024, uh, mm -hmm. when you'll sort of see uh, the possibility of a new shift in majority, or maybe a strengthened majority, maybe a, again, divided government. And, and one of the things, if you look back over the last 30 years or so, American people kind of like divided government, were frustrated by it, uh, but the founders sort of set that up, uh, that frustration is supposed to be the norm uh, that's there, because in a vast, diverse country of, of 330 plus million people, we're not going to agree uh, on everything, or we're even going to take a long time to get 60 to 65 percent of us to agree. And oftentimes it'll take two cycles uh, in order to get enough people to realize that this is what should pass. Um, yeah, there's, and so in some ways I go back to to one of the figures. Um, there is disagreement. Uh, one of the things we do is we try to convince the opponents and the American people of our points of view. We debate on the House floor. Uh, we debate in committees. We debate on television, on radio, and on the internet, and in the newspapers. And every two years, we have a huge debate. And in November, we see who won, or sometimes we wait until December to see that. That's not rancor. That's democracy. Uh, as one said, show me a nation without partisanship, and I'll show you a tyranny. Uh, and so when we think about ways that Congress is the means by, by which we resolve our conflict uh, in civil ways, uh, you see breakdown in civility that led to the Civil War uh, in 1850, the, after the 1859 Speaker's Race. Um, but we haven't reached that point, nor do I think we will. Uh, partly because what you have, as long as you maintain civility within the House, uh, the Senate is a very civil body. Uh, the House gets raucous, but as long as you maintain civility, civility can combine with partisanship so that you can have votes on principle, but also compromise that will enable the majority to act its will. Um any last uh, uh, things? Well, we are at time, the end. Fred, but this has been an extraordinary conversation, further proof of why it's so important to have a historian of the House and uh, to have such a great one with a U Chicago rigor uh, to dive into it. And you see that in the many thumbs up and nods across our screens. Um, yeah, I'll give you uh, maybe a, a parting shot here uh, at you know, what makes you optimistic in this moment? I'll, I'll share my own, which is hearing you, we've been here before and there's flexibility built into the system to allow us to navigate this moment as hard as it may be and to find a new way forward and miss polarization. But let me turn it over to you for the final word. Well, one of the like, things I love about the Graham School is I'm sure there's a significant amount of dif disagreement uh, on screen, but here we're able to discuss civilly uh, as a way because we have, uh, really deep respect for many of us here, uh, one with another. And one of the things I'm hoping to do is next summer, I uh, have a class that will look much closer at this, a, a Graham School class. But uh, as long as we can use these formats and make sure that uh, everyone has a chance to be heard, uh, that you have that minority right to have one's voice heard, that no one is silenced, uh, while at the same time having procedures put in place to allow a majority to work its will so that you don't have a, a tyranny of the majority, but rather to have these uh, shifting majorities that allow the, the overwhelming percentage of the American people to get its policies enacted so that we can truly be said to govern ourselves. So uh, I'm optimistic. This is the, the second oldest political system on earth. Uh, we've been around since 1789 uh, and even prior to that in an earlier form of constitution. So I have uh, quite a bit of optimism uh, at this as long as uh, that uh, our public popular will can be translated into this process uh, to enable us to govern ourselves. So with that uh, last word, Seth, go ahead. Uh, no last words other than uh, you give us optimism. Thank you. Uh, it's a time where there is too little of it and uh, we needed to move forward. So uh, we are grateful on many counts, Fred. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation and looking forward to seeing how this history helps us to all understand the days ahead as nine people now vie for this role. Have good afternoons, everyone. Thanks and see you in class.